you haven't already done so, hey, comment there in the comment section. Let us know that you're, you're worshiping with us. Our, uh, our family of God is extending and continuing to extend. We have so many that are watching online with us every morning, so many that are continually coming back to worship with us in-house, and so thankful for you as well. Everybody matters right now. I tell you what, everybody matters. We love you. We love the people that are watching online, and I continue to encourage you, practice self-care. You know, take care of you and your family, and as God is opening the door for you to come back and you're feeling comfortable, hey, come back. we got lots of room in our sanctuary. Church is continuing to, to, to worship together, and we love it. We love it. If you haven't done so in-house, I was doing so over there this morning on our Sharing Life at Gateway page and my personal page. Take your phone out and go to Gateway Church Shreveport and share the live stream, and your friends and family that aren't here this morning can see the message as well. That's Gateway Church Shreveport little share button there. And I know you that are watching online have already shared it. It's just that little share button down in the bottom left-hand corner there. So, well, it's good to see you. I'm excited to be in God's house, excited to have an extra day off tomorrow. How many got to, anybody got to work tomorrow? I kind of killed that real quick, didn't I, when I jumped into that. Man, let's do that. Anybody excited to have a day off tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah, praise the Lord for that. Well, if you've got your Bibles this morning, turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. I'm going to introduce a new series this morning. Let me do so by just kind of jogging our memory this morning. Many of you remember that on March the 15th, we had our last in-house service pre-quarantine. And we were watching from home for nearly three months, hard to believe that. Uh, but nearly three months of watching online. Nobody was in the sanctuary. And it was finally June, the first week of June, that we started to assemble together again. And you know what? A lot changed. Our world has changed. Our nation has changed. How we uh, have church has changed. Jobs have changed. Our coming and going has changed. We've seen the rise of covid Many have lost jobs, businesses have closed for a time, and some have closed permanently. We've seen some get sick, we've seen some get healed, we've lost loved ones. Some that we worship with together are now with Jesus. We've seen the political wars increase, we've seen protests, rioting, looting. Political wars are are just intense. Racial issues continue to be in front of us. Name-calling has escalated. And I'll tell you what, if that's not enough, we just recently experienced a hurricane. I'll tell you, though, I've heard a lot of great words that are being used to describe 2020, but I want to share one this morning that I think describes it well, and that's unexpected. Who expected 2020 to be like this? Looking back to January 1, none of us would have said We expect all of the things that we've experienced over the last nine months. And so I want to encourage you this morning with a word. In fact, it's the title of our series. Good English, it's all going to work out. It's all going to work out. Come on, say that with me. It's all going to work out. Come on, believe it this morning. It's all going to work out. The Bible said it, I believe it. But I want to say this before I read the text. Truthfully, if your mind is working, how can we make such a literal statement in a world of uncertainty? Come on, how can we really say it's all going to work out when things are constantly changing? How, how can we say something's going to be all right when sometimes situations don't get better? Sometimes they don't get better. How can you tell someone it's going to be all right when things don't always go as planned? Come on, you know like I do that pain don't always go away. Pain doesn't always go away. I've had loved ones that still pass on. We don't always win, and you know what? Bad things happen to good people. But it's going to all work out. But I want to be real this morning because I'm a realist. 
And when the pain doesn't always go away and when life doesn't always get better immediately, so what? So what God? How do I handle a statement that says it's all going to work out when sometimes the pain doesn't go away, sometimes I still lose a loved one, sometimes things don't go as I plan, I don't always win. Well, I think the Bible gives us the answer. And I want to look at two theme verses in this short series and ask God, so what? So what do I do, God? And I titled this particular message from our text, In All Things. So if you're writing notes, In All Things is the subtitle for this series, this message that we have today. Romans 8, 28 and 29. I'm going to read out of the New International Version this morning. It says, and we know that in all things, let's say that, in all things. Come on, let's get it again. In all things. I don't mean some things, most things, the good things, or even some of the things that aren't quite that bad. The Bible tells us this morning, we know this, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord Jesus, I'm asking that you would use me as a conduit this morning to speak your word and encourage those that are listening, those that are here in house this morning, that it's all going to work out. And I ask you, Lord, to open our ears. May we hear what the Spirit has to say this morning. And may our lives experience the fruit of the word this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. When I read our text this morning, the Bible tells us that God is working. God is working in every circumstance to bring about something good. God is working in all things to produce something good. That's right. That's exactly what we're saying this morning. That's exactly the point. In every circumstance, good, bad, in every situation, whether I like it or I don't like it, in all things, you need to remember this this morning, God is working to produce something good in your life. What am I saying? That he's taking those things that are unfavorable and he's going to make something favorable out of it. And it's important this morning that we catch this, that perspective and understanding are going to shape your experience. Perspective and understanding shape experience. Now imagine this morning, if you will, that if I was to think of my Christian life, that because I'm a Christian, or let me say it like this, if my understanding and my perspective of my Christian life exempts me from hardship. Imagine the letdown that I would have when I experienced my first real trial. When some bad stuff happens, even though I'm doing good. When I'm trying to align my life in God's perfect will, not permissive, I'm trying, Jesus, to align my whole life, to love God with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love my neighbor as myself, to be in church on Wednesday, to be in church on Sunday, to have my kids in church, to teach my kids about the Bible, to tithe, to serve, to do all the things that a Christian should do. But imagine now, imagine if my understanding and my perspective of the Christian life is supposed to exempt me from anything bad happening to me because the covering of God is upon my life. Then imagine when I lose a loved one and I prayed and I fasted and I asked Jesus. Imagine the letdown. See, understanding and perspective is going to shape my experience. And that's why this morning I want you to have a biblical understanding, a biblical perspective, so that you can have a biblical experience about life. You'll hear me say this from the pulpit. I don't want to be conservative or liberal. I want to be biblical. I don't want to be Republican or Democrat. I want to be kingdom-minded. I'm a citizen of heaven, and a citizen of heaven shapes my citizenship here in the U.S. 
And so ultimately when Republicans and Democrats are done away with, and ultimately when conservative and liberal are no more, will I be biblical? Will I be Christ-like? Will I be kingdom-minded in my living? That's the question that we need to ask this morning. And so I want us to have a biblical perspective, a biblical understanding of life. And I've got three points in our text this morning. The first point is, and we know. The second point, in all things. And the third point, right from our text, God is working. And we know, in all things, God is working. Come on, say that with me this morning. And we know, in all things, God is working. See, you say you can't memorize scripture, you just about got that one down. And we know, in all things, God is is working. Prophetically, do something with me this morning. I say prophetically because we're about to activate something. You know how you go into a room and it's dark and you flip the little light switch? Come on, do this this morning. I want us to flip the switch and activate faith this morning. Come on, just flip it up. Activate faith. Turn the lights on. Flip the switch and activate faith this morning. You're going to activate that. What does the Bible say? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing what? The Word. You're going to hear the Word this morning, and I want you to activate your faith so that when you hear the Word, you will receive the Word, and as the Bible says, the Word will not return void. It will set out and accomplish all that it intends to do. As the rain falls and it waters the soil, the Word of God will not return void. We are activating the switch of faith this morning, and by faith we will hear the Word of God. The Bible tells us, and we know. Well, what do we know? What should we know this morning? See, this right here is so important to me. And we know. What should I know? What is it that the text wants me to know? Well, I'd say it like this again this morning. What I know gives me the understanding of my experience. See, if perspective and understanding shape my experience, Well, what you know about things is going to shape your experience. And so it's important that you know what we're talking about this morning. And we know. Paul just jumps right in. And he just expects his readers to know this. We know this. I don't even need to teach you about this. You know that in all things, God is working to produce something good in your life. This is elementary. This is not needing explanation. Paul saying common knowledge for believers is that we know this. And what do we know? That in every situation, favorable, unfavorable, good, bad, the ugly, whatever you're facing, God is working. Unfortunately, we don't all know this. What Paul says we should know, unfortunately, we forget. How quickly we can have amnesia the first time we experience something unfavorable. The first time things don't go as planned, go as we expected them to go. Because remember, perspective and understanding shape my experience. My experience is not a favorable experience because I'm a God-fearing Christian. And so what's going on in my life? Here's what you should know. In fact, I think it's so important we put it up on the screen. This is what it is. In all things, God is present and active, seeking to work in your life to produce good things. Catch it, eternal things. Leave that up there for me. I want us to see it because you got to hear this. In all things, He is present and active. He's just not present and complacent. He's just not present and maybe aloof. He is present in the midst of your unfavorable situation. In the midst of COVID, in the midst of quarantine, in the midst of the losing of a loved one, in the midst of losing your job, in the midst of the most difficult and hard and challenging times, God is present. But he's not just present, church. He is active. He is engaged. He is walking hand in hand with you. He is there to encourage. He is there to comfort. He is there to give wisdom because the Bible says, and what I know come on, comes from the Word of God, that if any man or woman lacks wisdom, 
ask God, and God will give it to you. He's not going to shortchange you on wisdom. He's not going to give you wisdom for a made-up situation. But God is giving wisdom for real-life situations. And most often, it's the hard situations, the challenging situations, when it doesn't all make sense. In all things, God is present and active. Come on. He's just not present and active. He is seeking Seeking to work in your life. Pause. Pause button. This is a pause button moment. If God is seeking, are you willing to receive? God's seeking to work this in your life. Are you seeking for him to work in your life? Jesus told us to ask to seek to knock. So catch it. We're there. This is, this is profound this morning. When It's so simple, but it's so profound when you think he's seeking to work in your life. God wants to work in your life. Your trouble, trial, challenging situation may tell you that God's not wanting to work in your life. But I'm telling you this morning, according to the scriptures, according to what we say, he says, and we know. You should know this. Come on. I'm just reiterating. But and we know in all things, God is working. He is seeking to produce good things, eternal things in your life. We could do an altar call right there. Honest, it's, it's good. It's, it's so basic. And that's why Paul said, and we know. And we know. And we know. You know, when I, when I think about shaping for eternal things, you know, this life is part of the big picture of life. But I'm telling you this morning, if this is all you're living for, you've missed it. You have missed it. This is a big part of life, but it's not the big, whole, big picture of life. I mean, what's 80 years? If I, I've always told you, if I get 80 years, great. If I get 90, wow. I don't know anybody in my family that's made it 80. There's probably been a couple, but 80 is a good number for me. 90 is a great number. As long as, I, you know, I'm just saying, but, but catch it, though, this morning. 80 years in light of eternity is like one grain of sand in all the rest of the sand throughout the whole entire earth. You can't count it. You can't measure it. Eternity is such a large thing, exponential, infinite, beyond our understanding. So you're living for something more. God is seeking to produce good things, eternal things in your life. And what is happening in this life is such a small portion to the big picture of what we see. And when I say good things, I want to clarify something this morning. I want to mention four powerful words this morning, four great words this morning that I think are, are very, very important that God works in our life. And I'll be back and forth on these words, but when God is working something good, I'm thinking about my faith. I'm thinking about trust. I'm thinking about my belief. I'm thinking about hope this morning. These are good things, lasting things. And I'm going to drive that point home here in just a little bit. But I want you to have a biblical perspective this morning, a biblical understanding this morning. Because we understand that we are living in light of eternity. There's a heavenly prize set before each of us, eternal things. So that everything or situation you experience is not wasted. There's something good being produced that has a lasting eternal effect. And our text gives us the exact answer. You don't have to like, you know, it's right there in front of us. You don't have to phone a neighbor or, or come to a, a, a church to hear the message. It's right there in your Bible. Pick it up and he says, the answer is conformed to the image of Jesus. These things are working in you to conform you to the image of Jesus. To the image of Jesus. We call it Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness when we're conformed, not just transformed, but we are conformed to the image of Jesus. You know, being conformed to the image of Jesus and Christ-likeness is more than just convictions. Slow our minds down this morning and take this in. Christ-likeness is more than convictions. It's more than convictions. Because convictions are not necessarily righteousness. And convictions are not necessarily Christ-likeness. 
And I think we have to be careful to think in our lives that just because I have more convictions, I have become more righteous. And the more convictions that I have, the more righteous that I am. You see, the Pharisees and the religious leaders had lots of convictions. But they always had an issue with Jesus because Jesus represented the life of faith and a relationship with the Father. And relationship confronted the religious. And the religious had a problem with relationship. So we have to be careful this morning that we don't define righteousness or Christ-likeness from convictions. Convictions are important. Convictions are vital. Don't hear me saying that we shouldn't have convictions. But sometimes you can venture off and think because you have more convictions or just because I don't do this, that, and the other that I'm more righteous than so-and-so. But what we know is that you're justified by faith. And because of our faith in Jesus, I am then declared righteous. Isaiah picked up and he said our righteousness is as filthy rags. And yes, we produce fruit, righteous fruit. The thing this morning is you're righteous because you're in Christ. And that's why I worship Jesus, because of his righteousness that is imputed to me. It's not my righteousness. He deposited something into my account. He deposited something into your account that you couldn't deposit on your own. You're constantly making withdrawals on stuff you didn't put in your account. You and I are righteous because of Jesus and Jesus alone. And that's why it's in Christ alone. That's why the cross is at the center because of what Jesus has done. It's Christocentric. Everything centers and revolves around Jesus. So Christ likeness is more than just doing something good or getting the answer right. It's more than just getting the right answer. Doing, doing. Righteousness is so much deeper than that. Faith in Jesus is righteous. And I think Jesus is concerned with those four words. Faith, trust, belief, and hope. Four powerful words that are developed in us. Developed in us when we're in the midst of hard times. Those in all things, but we know in all things he's working. I want to mention something about hope this morning. Often in the most challenging of your situations, we lose hope. Yes, faith can be diminished at times. Yes, you can slowly start to doubt and not trust. When you, you catch that this morning, right? When you're in the midst of hard times, sometimes it's hard to have faith. And sometimes it's hard to trust because of the pain. And so you start to doubt. And then your belief is affected because what do I believe? What do I even know anymore? which ultimately all affects my hope because what am I hoping for if I don't have faith in it? I can't trust it, and I don't even know what I believe anymore. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11.1 1 says. Hope is a confident expectation. So let's rewind. Did I do that okay? Sometimes. Smirk. I got a smirk there. I tried. So in the midst of your most difficult situation, and I'm going to give you five years to think about. Last five years, you, you could think of probably your most difficult situation. So remember our thing. In all things, God is active and present, seeking to produce good things in your life, eternal things. How in your most difficult of situations of the last five years did your faith grow? How did your trust grow and strengthen? How did your belief in Jesus begin to grow and get stronger? And how did your confident expectation that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think, how did that solidify? How did that grow? That's an application for us when we begin to think about that. Because hope is complete assurance that in life or in death, good or in bad, favor and disfavor, that God's going to prevail. That God is going to prevail. That is my complete assurance. That is my confidence that God is going to do these things. Hope, trust God. 
I am trusting God because I hope in God. I have a confident expectation. I am completely assured that He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly. I could also say in it like this, meaning that whether I live or I die, my hope is in Christ and it will not diminish. Last week I told you in the sermon that we talked about just about dead. That Abraham's faith did not weaken. Even when he was just about dead, it did not weaken. In your situations, in your circumstances, when you felt like you were just about dead, in life or death, good or bad, favor or disfavor, how is your hope, how is your faith, your trust and your belief growing? God wants to work in that. That stuff is pleasing to Jesus. This is what we know. Second point, in all things. Everything we just said is in all things. So I want us to focus in the way that it's phrased, in all things. In all things, he's working. So yes, it means in pain or sorrow. Yes, in life or death. That's right. In the good, the bad, and the ugly, God is working. God is working this morning. God is there. He's present. He's active. He is in the thick of it with you. He is your light in the dark place. He is your comfort in the uncomfortable situations. He's your peace when things around us are at war and it's not peaceful. You are not alone in all things. I always love what Isaiah said in chapter 43. It says, when you go through deep waters, I'll be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you'll not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Why? Because he says, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. This is who Jesus is. In all things, he is in all things. We would say it like this. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times. Sometimes we missay and misquote scriptures when we think that just because we're two or three are gathered, there he is. Contextually speaking, and I won't get off on a long rabbit trail here, but I'm very, it's very important, proper exegesis of scripture. When he says we're two or three gathered, I am there in the midst, that's when you're working through troubles and situations. When the elders come together and they are dealing with a Matthew 18 situation, when you gather together to resolve church issues, he's there in the midst of it. But you need to understand something. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. He is with you at all times. You don't need to gather with two or three for the presence of the Holy Spirit to be with you. That's why Jesus said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. Why? Because if I don't, the helper can't come. If the helper doesn't come, he's just in one place. But because he came, I know I've said it fast, but this is theology. He's in you. He is for you. He is omnipresent. His presence is in this room. Paul picked up in Acts and said, in him we live and dwell and have our being. Rest assured he's in your situation this morning. Every emotion, every thought, every fear, every concern, every ounce of the event that led to your tears shed, he was there. He was there. Through it all. And we know in all things, God is working. I want to invite Joseph and the team that's coming this morning to join me on the platform. Man, it feels like we just blew through this. I know you're like, I thought he was going to be preaching for another hour. Okay, nobody really laughed. I was kidding. I was kidding. Pop quiz what are our three points? And we know, in all things, God is working. A-plus students, A-plus students. God is working, come on, hear this this morning, in COVID, in the jobless situations, in businesses that are failing, in life, death, pain, sorrow, the list as long as it is, need to know God is working. He's working in the midst of the political wars. He's working in the midst of the racial tensions. He's working in the midst of the most unfavorable situations. God is present. God did not leave us alone in our nation. Just because there's protesting, rioting, looting doesn't mean God isn't present. It doesn't mean God is not active and He is seeking to produce good things. Find God is active in the midst of a hurricane. and God is working in the unexpected. 
how and why, though? That's the question. I've really already given you the answer, but let's look back at the text and let's just read it again. And we know in all things God works for the good to those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Those who love God, God is working in their life. He's seeking to work in their life. At times you may feel like you haven't loved God, but God's bigger than that. The Bible says that even when I'm unfaithful, he remains faithful. He meets you right where you're at this morning. God's working in those who love him, those he's called to live according to his purpose. He's got a calling on your life this morning. You that are listening in online, you might just want to write that in the comment section. God has called you according to his purpose. God's purpose. John 15, 16 says you didn't choose him. He chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Good things, eternal things. That's what God is doing this morning, seeking to produce that. But you hear me preach this all the time because verse 29 is a verse that we often overlook, but it includes such a powerful answer to how is God working. This is how he's working. God foreknew some stuff because he's the beginning and the end, and he knows all things. We call it omniscient. He's all-knowing. But he foreknew new things before anybody else did, if you will. And in doing so, he predestined that you and I would be conformed to the image of his son. One thing that I always have to ask myself in whatever situation that I'm facing is, how am I conforming to the image of Christ through this? How am I being shaped to be more like Jesus? That doesn't mean that I always get it right to start with. Sometimes you're just weathering the storm. You're just trying to get through it the best you possibly can. But here's what we do after the storm passes. You start to assess the damage. What did I pick up along the way that I shouldn't have? Man, my front yard picked up a whole lot of things that weren't there before the storm. You know what, though? All of those little sticks could represent things that I had to pick up in my front yard that I need to pick up in Dusty's life. Because stuff gets a little sticky. You know what I'm saying? So you weather the storm, then you assess the damage, and then you know what you do? You conform to the image of Jesus. What doesn't measure up? What missed the cut? This wasn't here before. Pick that up, put it in the wheelbarrow, take it back to the backyard. We're going to burn that up. That, that's, that we're getting rid of that. What in Dusty's life? The, the proverb tells us like this in Proverbs 17, 3. As fire tests the purity of silver and gold, so the Lord tests the heart. You've heard me talk over the last several weeks about searching our hearts. Producing good things, eternal things in my life. But I can't see it. I don't feel it. Maybe in the midst of it, the heat got turned up and you felt like you were going to quit. Because pain has a way of making us say things we never thought we'd say. I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm quitting. I'm throwing in the towel. I've had enough of this. You're asking way too much of me, God, and I can't feel you anyways. I don't see it and I'm starting to have trouble believing it. That's why I'm calling us back to check your faith this morning. Calling you back to check your trust this morning. Calling you back to check your faith your hope, your trust, your belief. I'm not even talking about your convictions and your righteousness this morning. I just want you to come through the storm with faith, trust, belief, and hope. I'm reminding you this morning of what we know. In all things, God is working. Nothing is ever wasted with God. He's developing you. He's shaping you. Pastor actually told me this before. He's told me over and over again. If God has not delivered you, he's still developing you. If you ain't out of it, you're still in it for a reason. Get all you can get. I ain't trying to prolong it. I ain't trying to be hard-headed. When I was sitting with Miss Lena this past week, she said, he's teaching me something. This is going on for a reason, so he wants me to learn something. I ain't out of it. And she had to have a third surgery in a matter of weeks. She said, God's teaching me something. We just sit there, talked about the Lord. She's telling me, you know, if it hasn't delivered you, he's still developing you. I end with a story this morning. 
titled The Tale of the Two Lips of God. When the British monarchy was reinstated back in 1660, they started to establish a series of laws, and one of them was the act of common prayer. It made ministers have to perform certain things. They started to mix church and state, and they were required to read and do certain prayers. And then about two years later, many uh, preachers began to rebel against this, about 2,000 to be exact. In August 17, 1662, a man by the name of Thomas Watson, he gave an address to his congregation, and he gave this first direction, and he says, First, you keep constant hours every day with God. Begin the day with God. Visit God in the morning before you make any other visit. In the morning, wind up your hearts toward heaven, and they will go better all the day after. Turn your closets into temples and read the scriptures. The two testaments are the two lips of God by which he speaks to us. The two testaments are the two lips of God by which he speaks. And we know, we know because the lips of God have proclaimed the word of God, the will of God, the understanding of God. When we make the two testaments, the two lips of God, they make us wise unto salvation. He goes on and he says, besiege heaven every day with your prayers. Thus perfume will fill your houses. I want to ask you to stand this morning. Digest the message as Joseph leads us to sing overcome again. You can overcome this morning in all things. You can overcome. It's going to all work out, and you can overcome this morning. I want us to sing a couple choruses of this as you think about and respond to this. You may just want to kneel at your chair. If you want to come to the altar, that's not old-fashioned. That's a part of our everyday life, worshiping Jesus. So feel free if you want to come to the altar and worship I'll come back up, and, and I have a couple announcements. Chantal has one. We'll receive our tithes and our offerings, and you can go home and get some lunch. Amen. Just would you lead us, give us a chance to respond.
You know, we say it like there is no testimony without a test. And so you may be in a test, but there's a testimony. And you overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Amen. I want to pray with you this morning. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you need to accept Jesus into your life. Maybe you're at a place where you need to restart that. Maybe the last several months has been really challenging on you. Maybe you're watching online and that's you. And I want to pray with you this morning and give you a chance to respond. You that are here and have already accepted Jesus, you're walking with God. But you want to be conformed in a greater way to the image of Jesus. And I ask you that question. How is your faith growing? How is your trust growing? How is your belief and how is your hope this morning? Because around here, our mission statement help you to move from where you are to where God wants you to be. And so I want to help you take that next step this morning. And if that's you this morning, let's all pray. You can pray with me. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Help me start my life new today. I invite you into my life and I accept that you gave your life for me. Make me new today, Jesus. Wipe away all of my sin. Give me a fresh start, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, to God be the glory, amen. Amen. Chantal, would you come? I know you have an announcement, and then I have one right after her. You can be seated real quick. Before we go, we got like three minutes, and we'll be dismissing. I'm going to get to the point. So um, many of you have um, been aware that we at the CPC, the Care Pregnancy Center, we do an annual banquet every year. It's a fundraiser. Um, our aim is always to raise $200,000, and we usually always raise about that. Um, this year, because of COVID, we are unable to have um, the 1,000 people seated in the same place. So what we have done, um, what, the, what Pastor Dusty and the board have graciously allowed us to do is allow Gateway Church to be one of the satellite churches that will live stream the banquet event. So this year, the speaker, her name is Melissa Odin. She is a, an abortion survivor. She survived um, a saline failed abortion at seven months gestation. Um, not only did she survive, her biological family did not know she survived. The nurse saw her gasping for air and took her to the NICU. Um, and then she was adopted, and she didn't meet her biological family till she was in adulthood. But God, through that amazing story, has brought redemption, healing, and reconciliation. And so you're not going to want to miss her story. Um, um, she's an amazing, amazing speaker, and we will live stream it. It will be a banquet setting, so it will be formal. Um, you can wear uh, Sunday attire. The only thing we ask is that you do register. So we'll be putting the registration and everything online so that we can know how many tables we can fill. So we will have banquet meal, and at the end of her speaking, you'll have an opportunity to give uh, towards the ministry. But again, Gateway Church will be one of the satellite churches um, facilitating that night. The night will be uh, October 20th at 6 p.m. Thank you. Yeah, so Cypress Baptist Church is going to be the site that is streaming it. We'll have tables set up in the sanctuary here. There'll be a meal, like she's saying, and we'll do everything and watch it on our screens. And so there'll be multiple churches throughout the city and around that are going to be doing this as well. And so just got to be creative during this time to be able to continue uh, keeping ministries alive that depend on our support. Amen. Uh, one other announcement I think is exciting. We are about to launch uh, life groups again. So Sunday morning life groups, I believe we're going to have at least three classes, maybe four maybe, that we've got coming up. Look for more information uh, next week. But September 20th, we're going to start having some classes that we'll meet. And then more information. Yeah, excited about that. And then we're even going to have life groups that are going to be launching again uh, that meet in homes again. And so we are uh, continuing to see, like if you look around, more and more people are coming back. And we need this. We need the koinonia. We need the fellowship and the study of God's word together. So that's important. Uh, In-house is going to be starting September the 20th, I believe. Is that right? September 20th, Becky? Great. Um, the, the last thing that I, that I have for us um, uh, before we receive our tithes and our offerings to go out, if you're new with us this morning, in the seats in front of you are Connect Cards. Please fill out the Connect Cards, and you can put those in the giving boxes on the way out. Just let us know that you're here. We want to connect. We want you to be a part of a church family, a great church family, a Bible-preaching church with great people doing great things for God. So get connected with us. Fill out those cards and put them in the, the box at the back. You can stand, and I'm going to pray over our tithes and our offering, and you can just give that in the box as you go. You can also do so online, download our church app, Gateway Church Report. 
Uh, or you can text 77977. It's up on the screen there. And then put GW Shreve in the text box, and you can do it that way. Um, or the traditional way, you can do that through the offering envelope back there in the back. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for providing for us. We know in all things you are working, even in our finances when it gets difficult, you're providing. Lord, over our giving this morning, may you bless it and multiply it, and may you give wisdom to the leadership of this church to be stewards over all that is entrusted. And I pray your blessing to be upon your people as they go. Those that are watching online, may you bless them today in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in Jesus' name. Amen.